The Ostrogoths Emerging as a distinct group from the Goths in the 3rd century, carved out their own significant chapter in the annals of European history. Migrating from the steppes of Ukraine all the way to the Roman frontiers, they found themselves embroiled in the tumult of the late Roman Empire's decline. The legacy of the Ostrogoths encapsulates the intricate dance of barbarian and Roman, war and peace, in the twilight of the ancient world and the dawn of the medieval era. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you. And if you're coming back for more, it's good to see you again. If you'd like to support the channel, links to the Patreon are in the description and comments. And if you feel inclined to do so, a like, comment and subscribe goes a long way. Now, let's get on to the topic at hand. A full history of the Ostrogoths. First, let's go back to the beginnings and define some terms. The distinctions among Gothic groups before the arrival of the Huns are indeed shrouded in a good amount of historical ambiguity, with the term Ostrogoths itself appearing infrequently and often in contexts that do not offer clear definitions. While some sources link the Ostrogoths with the Grithungi, the nature of this association is once again a matter of debate. It's suggested that these names may refer to the same people, which underscores a potential continuity or shared identity that challenges our understanding of distinct Gothic groups. Contrastingly, the emergence of the Ostrogoths especially as a force under Theodoric's leadership in Italy, is viewed as the culmination of complex interactions involving not just Goths, but potentially other groups as well. Now this perspective implies that the Ostrogothic identity was formed through somewhat of a series of fragmentations and unifications, which gives us a more fluid and inclusive process of ethnic and political formation than previously considered. Further complicating the picture is the scepticism regarding the existence of a unified Gothic ethnicity before these groups were politically consolidated. The viewpoint questions the assumption of a cohesive Gothic identity suggesting instead that what later became known as the Ostrogoths may have been a conglomerate of various peoples brought together under a common leadership. All of these debates certainly serve to highlight the complexities of ancient identities and the difficulty of applying modern ethnic categorization to ancient historical groups. The discussion around the Ostrogoths and their relation to the Grethungi illustrates a dynamic nature of identity in the ancient world, where social, political, and military factors often played a more significant role in defining groups than simply static notions of ethnicity. Now, one must also remember that when we look at these extremely early times, at least through the written sources we have, we are viewing these tribes and peoples through the lens of Romanization. And indeed that comes along with its own biases and its own cultural depictions. Indeed, you can think about how the Romans viewed the British, if we will refer to them as that categorization in the early days. So of course when we touch on cultural topics it's well advised that it could be taken with a grain of salt 
if it seems too heavily biased towards Roman civilizations versus the outside world. That being said, let's continue. One of the earliest, albeit dubious, references to the Ostrogoths appears in the Historia Augusta, a source notorious for its unreliable accounts. See, straight into the Roman sources. In this document, a list of Scythian peoples defeated by Emperor Claudius Gothicus, which is a fantastic name, includes a group identified through later scholarly interpretation as the Ostrogoti, or Ostrogoths, alongside various other tribes. However, the reliability of the Historia Augusta, particularly for the contemporary terminology, is widely questioned. Now, moving on to more clear references to Gothic subgroups. The first clear reference that we have that acts somewhat independently, the Tervingi, dates from around 291, while mentions of the Grethungi, Vesi, which could be Visigoths, and Ostrogothi appear no earlier than 388. The Ostrogoths themselves are explicitly mentioned by name in a definitive context only in 399, more than a century after the Tervingi's first record. And then there's a poem by Claudian from the same period that describes Ostrogoths mixed with Grethungi in Phrygia, indicating a more complex relationship between these groups and their identities. This poem of Claudian's, however, stands as the sole certain mention of Ostrogoths before the establishment of their kingdom in Italy under the Amal dynasty. The narrative begins to become a little more consistent with the work of the 6th century writer Jordanes, particularly in his Getica, which focuses on the history of the Ostrogothic Amal dynasty. Jordanes, who is indeed quite a lot more reliable, tends to equate the Grethungi with the Ostrogoths, omitting the name of Grethungi altogether and linking the Ostrogothic kings back to the legendary king Ermanaric, whom, albeit other sources, do describe as a king of the Grethungi. This conflation of identities suggests a latter reinterpretation or simplification of Gothic history, possibly reflecting a retrospective consolidation of Gothic identities under this newly founded banner of Ostrogothic identity. Now, Jordanes also introduces the notion that the Ostrogoths and Visigoths derive their names from geographic directions, Eastern and Western Goths, respectively. While this further complicates the understanding of their origins and relationships, but it certainly helps us organize which Goths are which. And it highlights the evolving nature of Gothic identity and, indeed, the challenges of reconstructing the nuanced histories of these groups from the limited and, admittedly, unreliable sources available. But some interpretations suggest that terms like Tervingi and Grethungi were rather geographical descriptors used by external observers to differentiate Gothic groups before their migration into the Roman Empire. This nomenclature is thought to have fallen out of use 
by around 400 AD, as Gothic peoples began integrating into Roman territories. The distinction between these groups may have been less rigid or significant to the Goths themselves, who possibly preferred self-descriptions like Vesi for Visigoths or Ostrogothi for the Ostrogoths, terms that conveyed more of a sense of pride or superiority. Once again, of course, they were not referring to themselves by these terms. These are simply things we are calling them in the future. They wouldn't say, I am Ostrogothic or I am Visigothic. They would just say, I am one of the Visi, one of the Ostrogothi. Or perhaps they would use a more localized identification. Now, this perspective argues against interpreting these groups as entirely separate entities, based on the mixed usage of these terms in the ancient texts that we have. The Ostrogoths and Grethungi are mentioned together, side by side, in some sources. Now that leads us to believe that it could imply a closer association, or even a shared collective identity. However, the reliability of these sources, particularly the old Historia Augusta, is indeed questionable, and it further complicates our efforts to draw firm conclusions. So, all in all, this early history and categorization of the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Vesi and the Ostrogothi is to be taken with a little bit of speculation on the side. But, by the 6th century, the terminology had somewhat evolved, with the solid terms Visigoth and Ostrogoth coming into common use, particularly through the efforts of Cassiodorus, who served under the Ostrogothic king Theodoric the Great. Cassiodorus's invention of the term Visigoth to parallel Ostrogoth was a literary and political simplification, distinguishing between the Goths of the West and the Goths of the East, in a period where the realities were undoubtedly a lot more nuanced. Now, this division while serving to clarify distinctions for historical and administrative purposes, may not fully capture the complexity of Gothic social and political structures. Think of a scene from King of the Hill, and I know this is a little off topic, but there is a scene where there is a character who is Laotian, and the Texans, who are somewhat ignorant of the outside world, albeit a terrible stereotype of Texans, may I say, ask the man in question, so are you Chinese or are you Japanese? And he responds, saying, I'm from Laos, and begins to provide a brief description and abridged facts about Laos. Well, upon hearing this, all of the local guys stare at him for a few seconds, and the main character repeats the question, so, are you Chinese, or are you Japanese? Which rather frustrates the Laotian character. Think of Visigoths and Ostrogoths, somewhat in these terms. It was a lot more nuanced and complex. Though, some people were indeed a Visigoth, and some people were indeed an Ostrogoth. Hmm. Well, Moreover, the Goths were known by various other names. There were names like Valagothi and Valameriaki, and this highlights the diverse ways in which Goths were identified, not only by themselves, but by others. Of course, their delineations among their own tribes were a lot more complicated than the outsiders were willing to observe. Of course, to the Romans, a barbarian was just that, 
a barbarian, just with slightly different mustaches. Now these names are not the only ones, but it's important to talk about them, as they were often influenced by leaders or specific historical contexts, and they underscore, underscore rather this dynamic interplay between self-identification and external labelling in the construction of ethnic and group identities by people who are perhaps a little bit ignorant of the cultural undertones of your personal identity. Once again, are you Chinese or are you Japanese? The late 4th century marked a significant period of turmoil and migration for the Gothic peoples as a whole, largely instigated by the expansion of the Hunnic Empire. The Huns' arrival in Eastern Europe pressured a great many Gothic subgroups, including known as the Ostrogoths and Grithungi, into either subjugation or alliance. Well, the ones who did not want to make one of those choices sought refuge by moving westwards. This movement precipitated significant shifts in the balance of power and demographic landscapes across the region. And while they may have escaped the Huns, well, they'd encounter plenty more difficulties to keep things exciting. Now the distinction between the Ostrogoths and the Grithungi during this time is admittedly nuanced, with some historical interpretations suggesting they may have represented the same people, albeit under different circumstances and names. The pressure from the Huns catalyzed migrations and military alliances that reshaped the Gothic societies in a way that could never really be changed back. A notable event was the mass entry of many Grithungi into Roman territory in 376, led by their leaders Alathius and Saphrax. Now was this migration that laid the groundwork for future Gothic settlements within the Roman Empire, and played a pretty big role in the formation of what would become the Visigothic Kingdom under the later ruler Alaric. Additionally, there is evidence that both Ostrogoths and Grithungi were settled by the Romans in Phrygia during the 380s, indicating a policy of using barbarian troops as federates within the empire's borders. This settlement strategy reflects the empire's broader approach to managing its frontiers, and the diverse peoples who crossed into Roman territory, whether as refugees, allies, or adversaries. The emergence of the Ostrogothic political entity in the 5th century particularly in the Balkans, signifies a consolidation of Gothic groups under a new unified leadership. The Amal dynasty, renowned for their leadership and valour, including service under Attila the Hun, eventually founded an Ostrogothic kingdom of their own in the region of Pannonia. The Amal's ascendancy to power was not merely a military achievement, but also a unifying force that coalesced various Gothic and local groups into a new cohesive political entity. Now, this kingdom's formation around 483 to 484 AD was marked by the integration of the Thracian Goths further emphasizing the amalgamation of diverse Gothic and non-Gothic groups under this new Ostrogothic banner. Now, under the shadow of the Hunnic Empire, the Ostrogoths initially served as one of the many vassal groups to the Huns. Well, they didn't really have much of a choice. 
fighting alongside Alans and Huns in significant battles, such as the Battle of Shalom's in 451. Now, despite dramatic accounts of their role in such conflicts, particularly as depicted by Jordanes, the historical reality of their contributions and the dynamics of these alliances are still up for debate. Jordanes, for example, is widely criticized for his somewhat biased account favoring the Goths, especially attributing the victory at Shalom's largely to them, whereas other sources highlight the critical role of the Alans in the Roman defense. Now, the narrative of the Ostrogoths begins to get clearer focus following the decline of the Hunnic power after Attila's death in 453. The Ostrogoths, led by the Amal dynasty, including figures like Valamir, emerged as a distinct political entity in the Middle Danube region, asserting their independence in the aftermath of the Battle of Nidau in 454. This period marks the beginning of the Ostrogoths' transition from Hunnic vassals into a completely independent power, navigating the complex politics of the post-Hunnic Europe. Well, their settlement in Pannonia, however, faced its own challenges, including conflicts with other groups like the Suebi and the Skiri, and a dependence on Roman subsidies due to their own difficulties in land management. But these challenges did not prevent the Ostrogoths from expanding and consolidating their position under the leadership of Theodomir and his son, Theodoric the Great. The Ostrogoths' movements and settlements across the Balkans their engagements with the Roman Empire, and the internal leadership dynamics reflect a broader process of migration, conflict, and political negotiation that was characteristic of what was needed at the time. Which brings us to the 460s. The Thracian Goths, who had been present since the 420s, became a unified people's likely under Hunnic influence. Now Theodoric Strabo, potentially from the Anmal family, became a key figure, especially after the death of Aspar, an Eastern Roman military leader who was actually of Gothic descent in 471. Now Theodoric Strabo led a revolt in 473, demanding recognition as the sole Gothic king and settlement in Thrace, alongside compensation previously tied to Aspar. And after some conflict, the emperor agreed, offering annual gold payments in exchange for military support, excluding actions against the Vandals in North Africa. Now, with Emperor Leo II's death and Zeno's rise in 474, Theodoric Strabo lost imperial favor, benefiting the younger Theodoric, Theodomir's son. By 476, Theodoric was definitely the favorite guy and he was bestowed honors like the sun in arms, making him a friend of the emperor, and granting him the title of Patricius and commander-in-chief. His domain along the lower Danube was acknowledged as a federate kingdom, theoretically receiving an annual subsidy. However, in 478, when Zeno orchestrated a confrontation between the two Gothic factions, Theodoric Strabo reached out to the Amal-led Goths, advocating for unity among all the Gothic people. Now, despite Strabo's efforts, 
Zeno continued to make offers to Theodoric the Amal, which were ultimately rejected, leading to warfare between the Goths and the Empire, prompting the Amal-led Goths to abandon the region of Moesia. Zeno then suggested establishing a new federate kingdom in Dacia for them, but the Goths tried and failed to seize Dures, being repelled by Roman forces. From 479 to 481, the Romans were primarily engaged with the Thracian Goths under Theodoric Strabo. His unexpected death in 481, caused by a fall from his horse, left his group without a leader. His son, Resetak, unable to maintain support among the Goths, was also killed in 484, some three years later. Likely on Theodoric the Amal's orders, but we're not sure. It seems most likely. Now this event, however, allowed Theodoric the Amal to consolidate the two Gothic factions under his leadership. And following these developments, Zeno was compelled to negotiate a treaty, recognizing Theodoric the Amal's position by naming him consul in 484. Despite this treaty, hostilities between Theodoric the Amal's Goths and the Eastern Roman Empire flared up again in 487, underscoring the ongoing tensions and complex dynamics between the Goths and the Roman state. Theodoric the Great, born around 454, just after the Battle of Nadal, emerged as the most distinguished Ostrogothic king, leading the Kingdom of Italy. His early years were spent as a diplomatic hostage in Constantinople, but this did give him an opportunity to receive a rather comprehensive education. Throughout his life, Theodoric navigated a complex relationship with the Byzantine Empire, sometimes allying with it, and at other times standing as its adversary, contending with Theodoric Strabo, the Thracian Gothic leader and distant relative of his. Now, despite all of the politics, Theodoric maintained his role as Ostrogothic king quite well earning recognition from the empire through titles such as patrician and consul. And his reign is notable for fostering religious tolerance. Didn't see that coming, didn't you? An approach that was groundbreaking at the time. Theodoric, an Arian Christian, sought to maintain a strong alliance with the Catholic Church respecting its authority over Rome and working to harmonize relations with Italy's nobility, the Roman Senate, and the Church itself. Now, by doing all of this, he made some pretty good friends, maintained the network, thus solidifying his leadership in Italy. Now, aiming to relieve Roman traditions and governance, Theodoric benefited the Italian populace significantly. With support from Emperor Zeno, he embarked on a mission in 488 to reclaim Italy from Odoacer, rallying the Rugi and other Germanic tribes to his cause. By 493, after capturing Ravenna and establishing it as his capital, Theodoric solidified Ostrogothic dominance by defeating Odoacer. His reign extended over Italy, Sicily, Dalmatia, and regions of northern Italy, marking around 500 CE the celebration as his thirty years as king. His efforts to unite the Ostrogoths with the Visigoths led to a broad confederation of Germanic peoples, enhancing their collective strength against the Roman Empire. 
His regency over the Visigothic kingdom further expanded his influence across Gaul and the Iberian Peninsula. Through the use of strategic alliances, including diplomatic marriages with the Visigoths, Alemanni, Franks, and Burgundians, Theodoric managed to further extend his power and cement his legacy as a pivotal figure in the transition from Roman Europe to medieval Europe. Of course, under Theodoric the Great, the Ostrogothic realm achieved a splendor reminiscent of Hermanaric's era. Yet it represented a departure towards a more civilized dominion. Theodoric adeptly managed the roles of the Gothic king and de facto successor to the Western Roman emperors, administering a dual system where Goths and Romans coexisted under their respective laws, but shared a sovereign. This balance, however, prompted the Byzantine Empire and the Frankish Kingdom under Clovis I to form an alliance aimed at curtailing Theodoric's influence, fearing his growing power. Theodoric's efforts to appease both Latin and barbarian cultures, while fostering unity between the Catholics and Arians, ultimately strained Ostrogothic dominance and signaled a shift away from Italy as the center of late antiquity. A Franco-Byzantine coalition challenged Theodoric's protective stance over Italy, leading to further conflicts with the Franks, who posed a significant threat also to the Visigothic realm led by Theodoric's son-in-law, Alaric II. But Alaric's defeat and death at the Battle of Voilet precipitated a period of turmoil. Following his demise, Theodoric assumed guardianship over his grandson, Amalaric, preserving his territories in Iberia and in parts of Gaul. But they did unfortunately lose the territory of Toulouse to the Franks. The Ostrogoths managed to retain Narbonne and its environs, marking the last Gothic stronghold in Gaul as Gothia. Theodoric's regime was characterized by a fusion of Gothic and Roman elements, with the Goths seen as protectors of Roman traditions, bolstering a sense of unity and defense against those external barbarian threats that always seemed to keep popping up out of nowhere. Well, the good times under Theodoric couldn't last forever. His death in 526 marked a division between the Eastern and Western Goths, foreshadowing the Ostrogoths' eventual assimilation into other Germanic tribes by the late 6th century. After Theodoric's death, the unity between the Ostrogoths and the Visigoths weakened leading to fragmented and infrequent collaborations. Amalric inherited the Visigothic realm in Iberia and Septimania, while Athelric became king of the Ostrogoths. Despite their attempts to govern, disputes among the Gothic elites led to instability. Theodahad, a relative, eventually seized power exacerbating internal strife. Oh, and uh, in terms of religion, the Ostrogoths' adherence to Aryan Christianity isolated them further. It attracted opposition from both the Byzantine aristocracy and the papacy. This religious discord, coupled with the Eastern Roman Empire's Justinian's law against Arian Christians, underscore the Ostrogoths' precarious position in Italy. Well, Justinian, aiming to reclaim the Western Roman Empire, 
initiated a reconquest in 535. Tasking Belisarius with leading the offensive and taking the fight to the Ostrogoths. Belisarius's campaign was successful, capturing key locations including Sicily, Naples, and they even got Rome back. Despite a substantial siege by the Goths on Rome, Belisarius held the city, and he later moved to secure Ravenna, the capital of the Ostrogoths, forcing King Witiges to surrender unconditionally. Well, in a surprising turn, the Gothic nobility offered the crown to Belisarius, hoping for a stronger leader. Belisarius feigned acceptance of it to secure the Ostrogothic leader's surrender, reaffirming the territory for the empire. Fearful of Belisarius potentially establishing his own rule, Justinian recalled him to Constantinople. Ravenna's fall shifted to the Ostrogothic resistance in Pavia, marking the beginning of the end for the Ostrogothic rule in Italy. Following this strategic withdrawal of Belisarius, the Ostrogoths, under the leader of a new king named Totila, managed to rejuvenate their forces, heralding a dynamic period of contention for Italy that lasted almost a decade. Totila's command was marked by notable military and political successes, most significantly the recapture of northern Italy and the expulsion of Byzantine forces from Rome. His control over Rome was solidified through drastic measures. And by drastic I mean he executed the Roman senatorial class, prompting a significant portion of the Roman elite to seek refuge in Constantinople. Now Emperor Justinian, in response to the Gothic resurgence, orchestrated a substantial military initiative around 550, aimed at reclaiming the lost territories and extinguishing the Gothic threat once and for all. The Byzantine counter-offensive saw early successes in 551, with a decisive naval victory over Totila's fleet, setting the stage for a significant land campaign led by the Byzantine general Narses. In 552, Narses' forces entered Italy from the north, confronting Totila's army at the Battle of Tagine. Totila's attempt at a tactical surprise ended in an embarrassment, and it resulted in his death, and therefore a critical setback for the Ostrogothic forces. But despite Totila's demise, the Ostrogoths, now led by a chieftain named Thea, rallied for a final stand in Campania. The Battle of Nuceria, however, culminated in Thea's death, and the ultimate capitulation of the Ostrogothic resistance. The Goths, acknowledging this defeat as divinely ordained, retreated from Italy, signifying the end of the Ostrogothic kingdom. This retreat marked not only a military defeat, but also the disillusion of what is the Ostrogothic identity, with the leadership vacuum in Western Europe quickly being filled by the ascendant Franks. The Ostrogothic endeavour to establish a realm that married Roman culture and administrative traditions with Germanic vigour, a vision embodied by Theodoric, ultimately did not come to pass. The failures of the Ostrogothic kingdom, and indeed of barbarian kingdoms more broadly, can be attributed to a combination of leadership voids political fragmentation, 
and shifting loyalties among the Germanic tribes. The Frankish rise to prominence was significantly shaped by these dynamics, suggesting that alternate outcomes in the Ostrogothic-Byzantine conflicts may have led to different trajectories in the formation of medieval Europe. Well, despite the military defeat and political disillusion, the Ostrogothic people did not just simply vanish. According to Procopius, they were allowed to reside peacefully in Italy, alongside their Rugian allies under Roman dominion. This accommodation paved the way for their eventual alliance with the Lombards, who launched their own conquest of Italy. This post-conflict integration of the Ostrogoths into the fabric of Italian society underscores a complex legacy, reflecting both the transient nature of political entities and the enduring presence of peoples and cultures beyond the lifespans of their kingdoms and rulers. I tend to think of the end of the Ostrogoths, somewhat fading into history, kind of like a old man going out somewhere to retire. A very long and hard life for the Ostrogoths, and all things have to come to an end. One day, surely, our people will come to an end too. And just as the Ostrogoths thought that it was the end of the world for them, and perhaps things would never be the same again, there's always going to be something new around the corner. And who knows what history has in store for the people of the United States, the people of Europe, the people of my own country, Australia. Perhaps we will be overran by the Goths too. <laughs> Maybe. Well, thank you very much for listening and excuse the last minute monologue but I do think it's interesting to engage in at least a, a little bit of fun at the end of these sorts of videos particularly since the end of the videos are usually quite sad where people are relegated to the dustbin of antiquity but we had fun anyway now I would like to thank my Mega Chad tier patrons, Stark Factory, JC, and Jeffrey. Three Chads, indeed. And if you would like to become a member of the Patreon, you need only follow the links in the description and comments. Otherwise, I'm glad you listened this far. And I will see you in the next video. Be good to yourself. Good night, everyone.